Welcome, thank you all for coming. My name is Ansel Sermersheim and I'm gonna be telling you about multi-threading using lockless lists and RCU. This talk is a bit of a follow-on to a series of talks that I gave at last year's um, convention. However, you didn't need to have seen those talks in order to understand this material. But I am curious, by a show of hands, how many of you were here for those talks? Okay, a few of you. Um, well, thank you for bearing with me for the first few minutes while I do a little review of the LibGuarded library and explain where we're going to be going with this to motivate the remainder of the, the talk. So first of all, I'm going to be talking a little bit generally about multi-threading and why it's difficult, or more specifically, why I think it's difficult, because most of the people in this room would probably agree it is and presenting a better way of thinking about multi-threaded design. Then we will shift and talk about where that idea ran out of steam when we tried to use it for its intended purpose, come up with a new solution, and then put it all together and see how it works in context. So, by way of an example, First of all, if you were to see this in a code review at your company, would anybody have a problem with this code? Looks sort of like a factory pattern. We've got something returning a complicated object. It's taking some information, doing some things with it, and then returning the object. Any issues with this code? We've got raw pointers and raw new. Why are those a problem? Because of possible exceptions, great answer. Where, where's the delete, okay? Ownership problems, all right. So let me fix this code. Let me fix this code by adding a comment at the top saying, make sure that nothing you call ever can throw an exception. And let's add another comment that says, remember to delete the thing that came back from this method. Happy? In the code review? <laughs> will, will your staff be satisfied with this answer? Temporarily, yes. <laughs> Temporarily, yes. I'm, I'm sorry if that will get past your code review board. My point is that comments are not sufficient to fix this code. We actually need a solution that solves this problem in a, in a mechanism of some type and as most of you probably have used many times, the solution is a smart pointer of some type. Let's look at another example. And this has now become a multi-threaded piece of code. Does anybody see any problems with this code? Okay, so we've got a container of raw pointers. There's a one comment that that could potentially be an issue. Um, the object may be dangling. The object may be dangling, so that could be a concern. So, good start to the code review. Let's say I replace this with a, a map to a shared pointer type. Would that address all those concerns? Very good point. So the comment was, if the item doesn't exist, then you get back a null pointer, which may not be what you expected, and it actually gets inserted into the map, which you can't do with a shared lock. So you've, you've identified one of the major issues with this problem. Another one might be that while you're locking, so look at something, you unlock and getting that thing back. So if, what's the intent of the lock? Sorry, uh, can you? I don't quite so, understand the context of that question. So you're locking within the lookup, but then you're giving back a pointer. If the locking is important for some part of the aspect, what's it actually locking against? Ah, okay. So the comment was, "What is the lock protecting here? It and is this complicated object potentially going to have a race condition in it once you've returned it? And that could happen. For the sake of argument, let's say that complicated object is thread safe in this case, but." That's certainly another issue. There's another major issue with this code. 
that is exactly analogous to the issue on the previous slide. But you don't see it because we're so used to writing multi-threaded code this way. What if I forget to lock the mutex? What, other than their names, ties together this cache object with the mutex that protects it? Nothing at all. Effectively, because of that comment, it's smart. Like, you are forgetting to lock the mutex. You're taking a long time to lock it. The comment was, and therefore, you're taking the wrong kind of lock. You know that won't compile, right? Which, pardon? Look at the function declaration of look at <coughs> and look at the implementation declaration. Oh, <laughs> very good point. So we also have a const non const mismatch. That, that, that review, wasn't. We would have problems. You didn't even compile your code. Yes. <laughs> that is, yes. And at, at some point, Google Docs will actually have a compiler embedded in it, and that wouldn't have happened. <laughs> So there's a bunch of problems, many of which we've identified here. Uh, this returns a raw pointer. Who's responsible for deleting it? We might want to add a shared pointer there. What if someone else deletes the object while it's in the cache? What if I delete the object but I don't remove it from the map? And the big one, if the key isn't in the map, then a null entry is inserted into the map, and we had the wrong kind of lock. We had a shared lock and we've modified data under a shared lock. And this is just undefined behavior. We have a problem with this program. So we need a better way to reason about shared data in multi-threaded programs. And shared data needs to be guarded. Thus the definition of the class guarded t. It's a template. It can contain any kind of data you'd like. And we'll go over the definition of this class and a little bit of the implementation and then show how it generalizes to more complex scenarios. Guarded T is the simplest of the classes in libguarded. It wraps together an object of type T and the associated mutex that guards access to the T. As a handle, when you lock the object, you receive a handle, which is a unique pointer to the object. When that unique pointer is released, then the object is unlocked. This makes it very difficult to get access to the object without having first locked it. It makes it difficult to forget to unlock it, and it ensures that only threads who've locked the object have access to it. You'll notice this looks very much like the mutex class in C++11, with the exception that the lock, the try lock, the try lock until all of these different lock methods, instead of just returning void and saying, I did it, or returning a bool that says whether or not I succeeded in locking, they return a handle to the object, which is the only way in which you can access the guarded data. The implementation of this is actually fairly straightforward. Um, the guarded constructor just forwards all of its arguments onto the internal data. And the lock method simply locks the mutex and then returns a handle referring to the guarded object with the deleter set up appropriately so that when this handle goes out of scope, the object is unlocked. Try lock is essentially the same extended to the possibility that it might fail. So we have to return in that case a null unique pointer. And the deleter is simply an, a uh, class that checks if this lock is currently owned. If it is, let's unlock it. So in four slides worth of code, we have designed a system that will prevent anyone from accessing this piece of data who has not already locked it. And it will ensure that when that person is done with that data, it is unlocked. Now we can generalize this to a lot of other classes. And if you want detailed explanations of a lot of these, go look at the presentation that I gave at last year's conference. 
But uh, for example, shared guarded is just the generalization of this to shared locks. So if you lock it exclusively, you get a handle that allows you to modify the object. If you shared lock, you get a const handle, which does not allow you to modify the underlying object, which would have prevented the case where we accidentally modified the map in our insert function. Ordered guarded is a generalization where instead of modifying the data directly, there is no um, there is no exclusive lock. Instead, you pass in a lambda that can operate on the object that is within the guarded data. This prevents anyone from getting exclusive access to the data outside of the limited scope of a lambda. There is then deferred guarded, which is similar to ordered guarded, except the lambda can be put on a queue and executed later if the object is currently locked. And then LR guarded, which uses the left-right algorithm to guarantee that readers never need to block. And writers can, again, modify using a lambda. There is also the copy-on-write guarded mechanism, which allows you to have multiple versions of the shared data. And as, an ob as a thread gains access to it, that version will be retained until it no longer needs that particular version of the object. So let's briefly go through what insert looks like using each of these classes. So if we move to shared guarded, then we will use a lock shared to get the handle, because lock shared exists in shared guarded, and the compiler will diagnose that you can't use the operator square bracket on a const map, so we will discover that we need to use a find and look, do the lookup this way. And then the insert, um, we, can, we must use lock instead of shared lock because we are going to modify the data. And again, the compiler will ensure that we have done the appropriate type of lock. If we were to use a shared lock here, this would not compile. If we were to use ordered guarded, then instead of doing a lock, because that doesn't exist in the ordered guarded class, we pass in a lambda that does the mutation we would like to do on the underlying data structure. And this will occur at the, at the time at which we do it. If we use deferred guarded, because we have maybe an eventual consistency um, option in our cache, then we do something very similar. We pass in a lambda. We have to move capture the data from, uh, that came in from the user so that it's stored in the lambda because this might be executed at some later time if the object is currently locked. And then the LR guarded goes back to the same syntax as the ordered guarded, except in this case, readers will never be blocked. This is accomplished using two different objects. Each one is updated in turn, and readers will read one object while the other one is being modified. So, and then in the copy on write guarded system, then we go back to, it looks very much like the shared guarded model. One difference with this is that there is also, because of the nature of the copy on write system, we can also add a rollback operation. So the writer of the data can at any point say, I actually changed my mind, let me discard all the changes to the data and just unlock the system. Now, here's an interesting facility that the guarded library gives you is how many times have you seen code like this? So that here we're going back to the original code where we had a shared time mutex because we've identified we need shared uh, and exclusive access. And we have a comment. And we have a comment that must be observed. This particular method must be called with that mutex held. This is a semantically meaningful comment. The program will break if we do not observe 
what this comment is saying. Wouldn't it be great if we had a way to enforce this? Well, we actually do now. All we have to do is make that method receive a handle to the data. This now means you cannot possibly call that method unless you have already locked the object and received a handle to the data so that you can then pass it to this internal method. The comment is gone because we don't need it anymore. It's impossible to get this wrong now. Any questions up to this point? Uh, comment. Why not make it constraf? Why not make it constraf? I guess the implication is you're not going to use it, right? I mean, you're just there to ensure it's passed and held during the call. Ah, the question is, so why not make it a const ref because we're not actually going to use it in the called method. We just want to make sure that the, the data is locked. We are going to use it in this method because there is no other way to access the data. So this method must have a, a handle. It's not just a lock anymore. It's not just a, a arbitrary notation that the data is locked. It is the way to access the data. So, question. When you use this methodology, don't you lose the ability of keeping multiple operations somewhat common? Like, you're going to be inserting things on the map. Something else may have already run and inserted the same thing on the map, same key, and you're just going to wipe it out. Whereas, and, not, and nobody's going to know you wiped it out, except it's just going to be replaced with a new shared pointer. But that's kind of something that you want. So the question was, does, well, does being, this... Uh, this being a templated class, you're, you're going to protect your data in a way that lends itself to not noticing those sorts of things. The question was, does this lend itself to non-atomically updating data in the underlying data structure, I think, if I'm understanding well, your... Sort of like if you're going to insert something in the map, you, you're not... You're, you're, you probably here either have a separate operation where you saw if there was something in there already, but now that was a separate lock, and now you have a lock to do the insert, and in between it was unlocked, someone else could have done a lock, and inserted that same key in the map. It, that that's, could certainly there, happen anyway. No um, coming back out to say that that's happened. Right. So if if it were an error to insert a an entry in the cache that already existed, then you could check that in the insert method because, remember, we have a, um, uh, in this case, it is deferred guarded. So, yes, in this particular case, we're saying we want eventual consistency. So, internal insert will return before it finds out whether the key was in the map. In this particular case, it would. If you want the constraint that you want to know if the key was inserted into the map multiple times, then you would have to use a different one of the guarded classes. Perhaps shared guarded would work better, because then you would get exclusive access to the map at a defined point in time, and then you could just you know look and see if the key is in the map and return an error if it was. Um, the The power of the deferred guarded and the challenge of it is the fact that it is eventual consistency which means you can't um, assert exactly when the update will take place. So what you could do, however, is the modify method for deferred guarded does return. If your lambda has a return value, then the modify method returns a future. So you could at some later time discern whether or not the operation was successful. Um, but that is the trade-off that one makes when you when you want to be able to defer this action to a time at which the object is available. Th does that answer your question? Okay, cool. And finally, the best kind of code is the code you don't write. Now that we've made this wrapper about shared data and had a way to make shared data safe, we can just use a map wrapped in a guarded variable. And we don't need to write insert or lookup. It's already there. It already has a familiar API. It's just STL with an additional wrapper around it that allows you to get a thread safe handle to the data.
I'm fairly sure there are no bugs in this slide. This is the only slide that I can say that about, that I've shown you thus far. <coughs> Any questions thus far? Okay. So that takes you up to what I had presented <coughs> last year. That's the review of where LibGuarded was as it stood. I released that in May of 2016. In June, we took some medical leave as Barbara had to have an aftermarket knee installed and that took quite some time to get back to our projects. In January, when we came back to this particular scenario and we wanted to integrate LibGuarded with CS Signal, which was the entire purpose of developing LibGuarded. We had discovered the need for some sort of guarded shared data during the process of implementing the signal slot connection for Copper Spice. We ran thread sanitizer during the process of integration and it said, you have a deadlock. And I said, oh dear, because the entire point of LibGuarded was to make it simpler and more straightforward to write correct multi-threaded programs that you could prove correct by inspection that you could easily see in a code review whether the code was reasonable. So now what do we do? Well, clearly there's something missing. So here's the real issue that we ran into in the signal library that resulted in a deadlock. Each connection involves a sender object and a receiver object. And the sender object has to keep track of the connections emanating from it, and the receiver object needs to know about the senders that may send it data. So for example, I might connect a push button, the push button clicked method, to say, Charlie over there is a window, and I might want to connect to his window close method so that when I'm clicked, I emit the clicked signal, that window closes. And as I mentioned, each, each of us has information referring to the other. We need to be able to keep track of each other. Now, when I am destroyed as the push button, I have to update Charlie. I have to tell him, I will no longer be sending you any signals, so forget I exist. Whereas, if he were destroyed before I, he would need to tell me, I no longer exist, don't send me any signals in order to keep the signal slot connection mapping consistent. Both of these have to happen. Well, we have two containers. What order do we lock them in? Do you lock the sender's list, the sender's connection list first, or the receiver's sender list first? Well, I'm the push button. I have to read my connection list to find out all of the potential receivers, and then lock their data to update it. The window must read its sender list to find all of its potential senders and then lock their containers to update their data. Classic deadlock problem. There's no way to resolve this with a shared lock. You can wander around for a while in the wilderness and try to find ways around this. Um, ignoring is a very popular solution. It, it doesn't happen that often. These are two destructors. What are the odds that two destructors will run at the same time? Um, you could just opt to wait until they work it out, put some kind of sort of time out on the process. You could arrange some sort of repeated try lock and back off algorithm. And it doesn't take very long going down these various roads before you discover it's just unmanageable and impossible and difficult to reason about the behavior of the system. So maybe we just check for the deadlock and assert. Well, that's a terrible solution for a general purpose library, but maybe it's the best we can do. Or just mark the unit test flaky because we really want the CI to pass and that just, we're done. Or don't run thread sanitizer because if you don't run thread sanitizer, it's unlikely you will ever discover this deadlock exists. As I mentioned, it's rare. I don't like any of these solutions. These aren't really solutions. 
So we looked at this and we said, well, CS signal is delegating responsibility for all of its thread awareness and uh, multi-thread safety to libguarded. It's completely valid for both of these destructors to be running concurrently in a multi-threaded program. That's not the bug. And the solution to this deadlock needs to be a change in libguarded, not in CS signal. It shouldn't be CS signal's job to work around a limitation in the multi-threading library. We really need another abstraction, another tool in the library. So what we really want is a thread-aware container where writers don't block readers. That's very important. And readers never block. And iterators are not invalidated by rights to the container. If we have these three properties, then we can construct code that works correctly regardless of what order or synchronicity all of these things occur in. So I looked around and I said, okay, how will we do this? Well, we looked at it in February and said, okay, let's, let's add a new class. And then in March, completed the integration with CS Signal and got Thread Sanitizer to run and everything worked. No deadlocks. Very happy. It also made a huge change in the code. So before the change, uh, before libguarded, the CS Signal library was using raw mutexes. And you'll note that this is the destructor for a signal base. So in this case, this is the push button in my example. We're locking our own connect li connection list. We're walking through it. We're looking for receivers. We're locking their sender list and updating it. And one property I'd like to point out here is if you see this in code review, there is nothing on this piece of code that tells you there is a deadlock because in isolation it isn't. You have to see the other half of the code, which locks the containers in the opposite order to know that there's a deadlock. This code is not buggy. Neither is the other code, but the combination of them is a bug. So this is a terrible property to have in a system where you can't test pieces in isolation. I'll also point out the part in a sort of purplish highlight where we're locking another container. And this is an additional container that was needed just to keep track of all the objects which were currently in the middle of being destroyed. And this seemed like the direction to go initially as we were implementing CS Signal. As most code does, this code evolved over time. And we discovered new constraints and new scenarios in which it could be called. And our initial attempt was to just set up a container that contained a list of all of the things which were currently being destroyed so that other objects which might be in the process of being destroyed could look at that container and say, I just won't touch that. And you can sort of make this work, but it's very challenging. And there are deadlocks potential in the access to this container. It just becomes exponentially more complex as you try to add more systems around this. After libguarded and the new containers I'm going to show you today, this code became much more simple. It's about the same length because we actually need access to the iterator so we can't use a range-based for loop. But we lock for read our own connection list. We loop over each element in that list. We lock the receiver's sender list. And we look for ourself in the list and if found, remove it. It's very simple code. So how do we actually make this code work? We need RCU. What is RCU? It stands for Read, Copy, Update. And it's a very common published algorithm for managing a multi-threaded linked list. It supports one writer at a time, and that's actually a fairly important property. It supports multiple concurrent readers. And what's important is the readers are completely lockless. 
the readers do not have to coordinate with any other reader or any writer during this process. And readers don't block writers. So it's impossible to have a deadlock with a set of readers and one writer in RCU because the readers can never block that writer. How does it work? Well, we have a defined procedure for updating any piece of data in the list. What you do is you read the current node that contains the data you'd like to modify. You make a copy of that node. You update pointers in the list to point to the new copy. And then you wait a while. And then you delete the old node. Once you're sure that nobody can ever see or reach the old one. Question. Does that imply readers starve out the writer? Does that imply readers starve out the writer? That's an excellent question. And it depends very critically on the definition of the word later. And there are multiple ways to define later. So, uh, question. Well, I think another way to think about it is a reader could starve a writer, so you need to make sure that none of your readers can. So the comment was, a reader could starve a writer, so you need to make sure that none of your readers block. That also critically depends, well, the answer to that question depends on the definition of two parts, later and wait until. The way you define that line very much changes the properties of this algorithm. Pardon? Yeah, well, I, later, so one definition of later will be defined soon, as in now. <laughs> so one of the places where RCU is used heavily is in the Linux kernel. It's used to update all sorts of data structures that are shared data, because as you might imagine, an OS kernel maintains a lot of shared state. And in the kernel, the concept of later is defined as such. Each CPU, over a period of time when it does a context switch or various other operations, will go through what's called a grace period. And a grace period is a, is a defined moment in the execution of a kernel thread where it says, I am not holding any references to an RCU list. So I can no longer reach any node that's older than this moment. What this means is that while reading, you really don't want to sleep or block, as noted. And since there's a fixed number of CPUs, there's a limit on how many kernel threads can exist. So when you write to this list, the write algorithm says, OK, do the read, the copy, the update, and then wait. I'll do the waiting. I'm the writer. And the way I'm going to define later is I'm going to block until every other kernel thread has been through a grace period. And then I know they can't possibly see the old node, so it's safe to delete. Now, in answer to a uh, second part of the answer to Arthur's question is, in this scenario, we have asserted that readers can't starve writers because we have stated that readers are not allowed to sleep or block while reading an RCU list. And this assertion is made in comments in the code. And that works fine because it's the Linux kernel and the people who develop the Linux kernel and the people who do the code reviews follow these guidelines assiduously. And if you follow these guidelines exactly, this works. So how do we implement this in LibGuarded? Well, how many of these tools are available to us in a C++ user space library? Well, there's no grace period because we can't force every thread to do anything in particular at any time. We don't even know how many threads there are or what code they might be running, which means we can't enforce a time period over which references can't be held. And there's certainly no way to enforce that a 
C++ thread can't sleep or block. And there's no fixed number of CPUs or threads or anything in this system. So there's no way we could even be sure if we could have the notion of a grace period that everybody had finished because we don't even know who everybody is. So none of these techniques will help us here. <coughs> so can we implement something like RCU in a user space library where we don't have any of these tools? And these are the reasons why it's very challenging to make this happen. One of the major ones is the fact that making writers block until the readers finish is really undesirable in a user space library because it just makes the behavior very unpredictable. So how do we do this? Well, this comes in a combination of two classes. Before, all of the guarded classes just wrapped some T. It's completely opaque data. The guarded, uh, the guarded wrapper has no idea what the internals of this data structure are. And it doesn't matter because it's just being protected by a mutex. Now we actually need cooperation between the guarded wrapper and the object inside it that is being protected because they need to interoperate. This, so these are the two classes that we're going to implement. The RCU guarded is the wrapper which controls access to the RCU container and then the RCU list is one particular type of container that supports the RCU operations. So what does RCU guarded look like as a user? Well, it's pretty simple. It actually looks a whole lot like the earlier guarded classes. There's a method called lock read that gives you a const handle. There's a method called lock write that gives you a non-const handle. We know how to work with this. They're just smart pointers of some type that give us access to the underlying implementation. What does an RCU list look like to the public? Well, it looks like a sequential container. Const methods begin and end. It has a range. Non-const methods we can insert, we can erase, we can push back. All the methods you're used to. So it acts just like a regular sequential container. How do we implement this on the inside? Well, let's first look at insert. So in order to do an insert, we allocate a new node, we update the next and previous pointers of that node, and then we link it into the list by updating the pointers of the adjacent nodes. And concurrent readers will either see the new node or they won't. That's okay because we're not making guarantees about consistency here. We're just making guarantees about correctness. So if a reader is reading the list at the same time, they may or may not see the, old, the new node. They are guaranteed to traverse from a beginning to an end of a list in a consistent fashion and not see partial nodes or jump off into nowhere. There are a few corner cases to deal with, inserting at the head and the tail. They're not particularly interesting for this talk. And you have to make sure that the pointers in these nodes are updated atomically, because otherwise the readers won't see a consistent view of the structure of the list. So that's insert. It actually looks fairly similar to a normal linked list insert, with the exception of the fact that we have to update the pointers atomically. Now let's look at erase. This is the update part, essentially, of the RCU list. We update the adjacent nodes to skip over the node we're trying to erase. We mark this node as deleted so that it can't, be, uh, can't attempt to be deleted again. And we add this node to the head of a special internal list. Readers will either see the old node or not. Again, we're making no guarantees about synchronization, just a consistent list. We have to deal with the head and the tail again. And we, as long as we update the pointers atomically, this works fine. But what do we do afterwards with the old node? Well, that's where we keep track of it on this special internal list called the zombie list. It's a singly linked list. It's a completely separate auxiliary data structure in the RCU list. 
that is used to track when a node has been erased. It's also used to track when a read handle to the RCU list was opened or was created. So it tracks a read in process. So as you'll see, this is a singly linked list. This is what a, a zombie list node looks like. We've got an atomic pointer to the next entry in the zombie list. We've got a non-atomic pointer, because we don't need atomicity here, to the zombie node that may potentially be unused. And we've got an atomic pointer to the read in process. This is a pointer to a particular handle that is open. It is of type RCU guard in this case. Either the zombie node field or the read in process field will be populated, not both. Because each entry in this list is denoting either a zombie that was created at some point in time or a point in time at which a reader started reading the list. Any questions on that? It looks like garbage collection. It looks, it does look a little bit like garbage collection. It's deterministic garbage collection. And this mechanism is actually pretty much disappears in a garbage collected language. But this is a way to support it in C++. So how do we maintain this list? When a read handle is created, it adds itself as an entry to the zombie list. When the reader finishes, it starts walking from its position in the zombie list toward the tail of the list. If it finds another reader before it gets to the tail of the list, it says, ah, I am not the oldest reader. So there could be an older reader that still has access to these nodes. So I will leave it alone. I will remove myself from the list. If the reader makes it all the way to the end of the list before encountering another reader, then it says, I am the oldest reader active that could see any of these zombie nodes. So I will clean the list from my position to the tail, delete all of those nodes, and then shorten the list, truncate it. Make sense? The additional aspects is that the read lock returns a read handle. A read handle can, oh, question. Excellent question. So the question was back here, how can you delete yourself from the list without potentially damaging other um, readers that are walking the same list at the same time? And the answer is, we don't actually delete the entry from the list. All that we need to do is atomically set this read in process field to null, which means this reader is no longer participating in the list. We leave the node there. Someone else will come along to clean it up later. But by setting that field to null, we have removed ourselves from the list. Does that make sense? Any other questions on this portion? I have a question. Is there only one read in process, or can there be multiple readers on multiple different nodes? Uh, the question was, can there be multiple different readers on multiple different nodes? Yes, absolutely, there can be multiple readers. Remember, this is just a single node in the zombie list which is a singly linked list that can be arbitrarily long. So the purpose of this zombie list is to, is to enforce a sequence on the order in which nodes became zombies and readers started reading. And since we can determine that sequence, then we can guarantee which zombies are eligible for deletion when each reader completes. Does that answer your question? Not, you, not see, yet. Okay, not yet. <laughs> is there a, a continued portion to that question? Could there be more than one reader on the same zombie node? 
Ah, could there be more than one reader on the same zombie note? I, okay, I get your question now. And the answer is no, because when a reader is, when a reader begins its reading process, it creates one zombie note that belongs to it and places that node in the zombie list. So that node is, is dedicated to that particular reader. You can have multiple readers operating concurrently, but they all will have their own individual node in the zombie list, and therefore we're imposing an ordering on the readers by virtue of the fact that this list is ordered. Question? So whenever read happens, New list to the zombie, uh, zombie, new node to the zombie list is added, and when the read completes, at at some point the whole list is cleaned up, regardless whether there were deletions of the node or not. Upon every read, a new node to the zombie list is added. It's true. So on on every read, on acquiring a read handle, a new node is added to the zombie list. And then when that read handle expires, some amount of cleanup is done. And it may be cleaning up the entire list from that portion to the end, or it may be as trivial as just atomically setting the value in that node to null. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Could you... If you find another reader, could you delete up to that point? <laughs> and the answer is no, because those nodes are newer than that reader, which means the reader could have seen them, depending upon what order it traverses the list in. So if we... so. Assume that we have a, a reader A, and we have an older reader B. The zombie nodes between A and B were the nodes that were deleted after B started reading, but before A started reading. What that means is that B could have seen them, because we don't know how far <laughs> B had made it into reading the list before that node was deleted. The only way we can be sure that these nodes to the right of our current position are eligible for deletion is if no older reader exists. Then we know that we are the oldest reader and all of these zombie nodes are older than us. Therefore, we could never have seen them and neither could anybody else. That's when we can clean the list. Is that all right? Uh, just as a point, <coughs> remember the insert is happening at the head. That's why ah, you're talking yes. about an older node. Yes, that that's a good point. Um, all of these nodes are inserted at the head of this singly linked list, so it's ordered from newest at the head over to oldest at the tail, which we don't track because we don't need to. And we already went through that. So one of the consequences of implementing a linked list this way is the fact that, well, the way we get iterators is by locking the list for read. So we get a read handle. And then from that read handle, we can access the list and get an iterator. We can call begin, end, or what have you. This iterator will not be invalidated as long as that read handle is in scope period. Normally, a linked list provides a slightly weaker invalidation guarantee, which is iterators will only be invalidated if the element they point to is deleted. We're making a stronger guarantee. We're saying no iterator is ever invalidated while the read handle is active, regardless of what a writer does to the list, which nodes they delete or modify or update. This is a very important property to have because it means that as a reader, I can always walk from the beginning to the end of the list and my iterator will never become invalid 
regardless of what any other thread in the program has done. Again, I may see a different set of values in the list, depending upon what other threads have done, but I will never have an invalid iterator. Since there's no synchronization between the readers of an RCU list, modifying an element directly would be a problem. You would be causing a race condition because locking a list for read doesn't actually lock anything. It doesn't exclude any other access. So to prevent this, all iterators are const because we really don't want you to be able to modify the data stored in the list. Recall the way to modify data in the list is to make a copy and update the pointers and insert it in that location in the list. Now, if you have mutable data in an RCU list, the fact that this iterator is const does not prevent race conditions. So, if you have mutable data, it should probably be atomic, or you need some other mechanism for ensuring synchronization between the readers which are modifying data. Typically, to modify data in an RCU list, you would just want to insert and erase. So let's look at some of the differences between the way RCU is implemented in Linux versus how it can be implemented in a user space library. In Linux, an RCU reader has very little cost. In fact, in, in many cases, it actually doesn't do any operation at all. LibGuarded requires a memory allocation for each read handle. It's very difficult to get around this, and it requires some cleanup each time a reader completes. So the read operation is slightly more expensive than in the Linux case. On the other hand, we don't have the property in libguarded that writers have to wait for the newest reader to finish. Because the writer is just throwing a note on the zombie list and completing. And we know that the last reader out will turn off the lights, if you will. Linux RCU is really optimized for speed, and the write performance can actually be surprisingly poor because of this behavior of blocking until all threads have gone through a grace period. Whereas libguarded RCU is really designed for non-blocking. And this is a very important property because if you have a data structure that is non-blocking for readers, and where readers don't block writers, then you have no deadlocks regardless of what order you operate on these containers. Any questions up to this point? Did you compare it to SRCU? Did I compare it? Pardon? There's also an SRCU on Linux, which looks like you will work better than what you have. Did I compare it to S? Sleepable RCU. Did I compare it to sleepable RCU? I looked a bit at that. There are some implementation differences there that made it not fit well in the guarded API. Um, the, um, I'm trying, I, I'll, I'll have to take that offline because I did look at it briefly, but I don't recall what the, the concern was that I had with that implementation. Any other questions? So, where is libguarded going soon? Well, replace and update would be very useful methods to have in RCU list. Their implementation is not tremendously challenging, but they weren't needed for this particular application, so they haven't been implemented yet. The ability to unlock read handles and write handles before their scope exit is just a small optimization that I'd like to make in the definition of the read handle. The main thing that I would like to see happen going forward is to add associative containers. Because having, an, a, uh, non, uh, having a thread aware, non blocking associative container would be a very useful thing. And it is quite possible to generate an associative container using these techniques and using a skip list. <coughs> so, Having gone through all that and implemented all of this code, putting it all together, 
was the process of going through this. When we developed Copper Spice, we really needed to design an underlying signal slot library. And the deadlocks that we discovered while designing that library led to a threading library. And being unable to document Copper Spice, <laughs> we ended up creating DoxyPress along the way and switched parsing from Lex to Clang. Then we decided we really needed a Unicode aware string library because of the amount of mangled text we encountered in this process. These libraries all feed upon each other because CS Signal uses libguarded and Copper Spice uses CS Signal and CS String, and then DoxyPress uses Copper Spice as its GUI layer. However, this is the complete list of libraries. We're fairly sure that that's the complete set that's needed. We have some additional work to do in CS String, and we talked about this yesterday. Uh, we need to add some more encodings, implement a small string optimization, add some locale-aware comparisons and normalization functions. In libguarded, as I just mentioned, I'd like to add associative containers. I'd also add, like to add lock-free containers. The lock-free container portion actually turns out to be not entirely trivial. And the reason it's not entirely trivial is not because lock-free containers are challenging. There are well-defined algorithms for working with them. The reason is because the API for working with them in a sane way is challenging. Because if you have multiple writers accessing a lock-free container simultaneously, it can be very difficult to reason about what order the changes will be made. In some sense, it would be easier to work with a lock-free associative container than a lock-free unordered list. Because at least then, you know that each element has its place. Whereas a lock-free um, doubly linked list is very complex to update properly and get consistent results. We're also in the process of completing the integration of CS string with Copper Spice and redesigning QMAP and QHash to use the appropriate STL containers. There's some other optimization we'd like to do and we'd like to be able to compile on MSVC probably using the Clang front end. We'd like to improve the move behavior of CS Signal for some improved efficiency. In DoxyPress, we're working on adding parsing support for the newer versions of Clang and a great deal of optimization and also improving Unicode support as we integrate the CS string library. And just to recap, these are all the various libraries and programs that we have developed over this project. There's also Kitchen Sync, which is a great demo of all of the various pieces of code that I've shown you here, including every library that we have designed. And you can find all of our information on our website or contact us directly. We very much welcome email. Any questions? If you have a write and no subsequent readers, don't you leak memory? And that is an excellent question. And the answer to that is that in order to do a write, you need an iterator, which means you need to have read the list. So a writer is also a reader, which means if there are no other readers active, the writer will clean up after itself immediately. Other questions? That leaves a small window, a chance where everything sits in the zombie list because nobody is writing or reading it. That leaves, so the question was that leaves a window where everything sits in the zombie list because no writer is. No writer is coming in. No writer is coming in or no reader is reading. Yes. Uh, actually, if there's no active readers at all and there's a single writer, then when the writer finishes, it will clean up the entire zombie list because there is no older reader. So entries will stay in the zombie list, the zombie list will grow until that write handle is released, and then it will be cleaned up. Um, it, 
there is a potential optimization to delete nodes immediately if there is no outstanding readers, but it's very difficult to do that in a race-free manner because you can't determine if there is a reader that is about to start reading that may have read the head but has not yet registered itself. That's not an atomic operation. When do you anticipate uh, having the associative containers? When do we anticipate having the associative containers? Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, hopefully in the next few months. Um, the implementation is, is partly there and it uses a lot of the same mechanisms, so I'm hopeful that it will be fairly straightforward. But uh, we all know how software schedules go, so. <laughs> Did you actually show a snippet of the code? Remember you showed conflict destructor, so create signal and slot. And they were using initially just the lists. Did you show the, the same snippet with the RCU list? Yes, I did. Uh, yes, um, uh, I did show that snippet with the RCU list. And um, let's see. It is. This is the code with the RCU list in place. Since you can't see the, the data type definitions, I, I can see why it might not be clear that this is the new libguarded code using RCU list, but in this case, mconnect list and mpossible senders are both RCU guarded RCU lists. So it really is this simple. This, this looks like code that doesn't, that isn't multi-threaded. I mean, with the exception of the locks, which are enforced by the compiler because you can't access the data without locking these containers, everything else in this is just a straightforward for loop using some iterators, removing some elements from a container. There's nothing in this code that leads you to believe that it's threat aware other than those two highlighted lines. Does that answer your question? So with the with the flurry of allocation deallocation on the zombie list, it seems like uh, can I can I insert an allocator like a ring buffer or is is there a mechanism to inject sort of an efficient reusable allocator to that? Is there a mechanism to inject an allocator into this so that we can add efficiency? Was the question, um, and the answer is yes. And the answer is um, actually there's an error in my slide deck because the uh, yes. The RCU list T is actually an RCU list of T comma A. Oh, okay. there the allocator is right there. Um, I, that's an oversight. Thank you for addressing that. So yeah, you could you could do all sorts of interesting things, including if you know a priori roughly the size of your thread pool, say, you could have a fixed size allocator or a slab buffer here, or any one of a number of interesting allocation strategies to make this more, more uh, performant. So for the copy portion, it's copying the whole width, not just the node you've been changing. Uh, for the copy portion, the question was, for the copy portion, are we copying the whole list? And the answer is no. Uh, the only node that needs to be copied is the node that is being modified at that time. Um, ah, so isn't it three nodes, the previous, the next, and the one you're deleting? That's a really good point. However, there's a difference between the previous, the next, and the current of what we need to change. In the current node, the actual data, the T, is changing. And that is not thread safe because we don't know if the T can be accessed without race conditions. So we have to copy that entire node to a new node. When we update the previous node to point to the new node, and we update the next node to point back to the new node, those pointers are atomic pointers. So we don't have to worry about copying the previous and next nodes because we can update those atomically and guarantee that a reader walking the list will see either the old or the new node. And since neither the old nor the new node was ever modified, the reader will see a consistent view of the data in the node. Does that 
give you a, a better sense of that, or yeah, is it okay? Okay, cool. Something occurs to me that, that if you have two pointers that are each atomic, uh, but they're separately atomic, right? So I, I could I could imagine at least that theoretically there could be some race conditions where something is going across and it's hitting one, but coming back and seeing something different. I think so because when you first update your so new the node with the next and previous pointers and same you update the next and previous, I think you're fine. So the question was, since you're not updating the, or the comment was, since you're not updating the next and the previous nodes atomically with respect to each other, since that's, you know, double compare and swap, which is very expensive to simulate and doesn't exist on most hardware, can you have a race condition? And the answer is sort of. It depends on what you mean by race condition. If you mean race condition as defined by the standard, the answer is no. because each pointer is updated atomically, and regardless of which direction you are walking, you will see a consistent view of the list. It is possible that a reader walking one direction and a reader walking the other direction simultaneously, one may see the new data and one may see the old data. But that's not an inconsistency because we're not actually guaranteeing synchronization between the writes and the reads. So that's not an error. Sounds like well, atomic, uh... Atomic instructions are not a relativistic invariant. You're reading fast enough. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think there's another case where, again, it's not a race condition according to the standard or according to Fred Sanitizer, but you you provide full iterators on this list. You don't have to gain an end and, and like I can plus plus an iterator. Yeah, the, um, so the question is part, the first part of the question is. Full iterators are provided. They're bidirectional iterators. They are bidirectional. They are bidirectional. Input iterators, there would be no problem and no inconsistency. As yeah. soon as they're forward iterators and you can keep a copy, I can do a thing where I take a copy of an iterator and then I iterate over the list once and I count the number of times I see 42 in it. And then I use my copy and I, and I iterate over it. I count how many times I see 42 and I get different answers because I did one slightly later than the other. So, but this the, is okay. It's not a race condition. It's just don't do that. So the comment was, <laughs> if if you iterate over the but list, comment at the top of your files, don't do that. If you iterate over the list multiple times using a copy of the same iterator, or just calling begin twice, would also have the same effect. If you called begin, iterated till end, and then called begin again, iterate till end, you will see a different list potentially, if a write has occurred in the meantime. And again, that's, as you said, that's not a race condition as defined in the standard. It's not undefined behavior. It's just an eventual consistency sort of model of the data, where you are guaranteed to see a state that existed at some point in time, but not exactly... Um, but it does mean you shouldn't use any SDL algorithms on this. The comment was things where it's, the distance is now meaningless. You know, it, it's, a, it's a bad idea to, to ah. do anything with these algorithms. So the comment was this does mean that that uh, many of the standard algorithms aren't a good idea to use on these iterators. Um, and the answer is many of them are not, but many of them are. For example, std copy works fine assuming what you want is a copy of a state of the list. You may want to do some local processing on a state of the list that existed at some point. Or um, std transform, again, would work perfectly well. It's true that, it's true that calling std distance on the begin and end iterators will give you a well-defined but meaningless value because it is the value that existed at as you traverse the list. But it also means that if any standard algorithm starts off by saying, okay, how many things do I have to do to stiff distance, and then it does that many things, it will be wrong. And I don't trust my standard library not to do that, because normally that's an optimization, but in this case that is super dangerous. This is why a, a lot of, or at least, I don't know, a lot, the one <laughs> implementation of, of an RC list I've seen uh, just provides a dot contains method. That's it. It's like you can ask me if I contain a thing, I'll tell you something that's true or false. 
and, and that's it. Yeah. That's not much of a list then. But <laughs> neither is this. <laughs> Yeah, they provide a source method since we can't use uh, any other method to sort it. Like, I mean, standard algorithm doesn't provide you to sort anyway. Like, I mean, I know it's true if you know, work around it normally, but in this case, you can't because of the distance problem. So the question was, do you provide a sort algorithm? Yeah. And the answer is no. And the reason is because a sort algorithm wouldn't make sense because you would have no way of sorting it and then maintaining it sorted. So the answer to that is to have a different type, which is a sorted RCU list, which could then maintain the invariant that the nodes were sorted according to whatever predicate you wanted to supply. And that gets into the associative container side of things because then you need indices onto the list. I have one situation where I had at the beginning of the code that um, I did insert and reads, but later on in the code I only did reads. So in that particular case, and I only needed it sorted afterwards. So in that particular case, I would need to do a complete copy because it was only sorted. So the, uh, the comment was in some cases you want to do a bunch of inserts and erases at the beginning of the code, and then later on, you only want to do reads. And in that case, you probably actually want a different container. So what you would want to do is, during the first phase, use an RCU list to maintain the information. Then, when you know through some external a priori mechanism in your program, I'm done making updates to this list, take the list, you know that no other writes are occurring because you know that as part of your program, you know that it's stable. You can copy it into a more appropriate container, which is going to be faster anyway, because it's not going to be a doubly linked list. It's going to be a vector or a map or a set or whatever it is that would be useful. And then you can protect that with a shared guarded. And then you can ensure that all of the other code in your program can only read it. But if it's read only, why would you protect it? And the question is, if it's read-only, why would you protect it? That's true. If if you just expose it as a const reference or something, then you don't even need to do that. I'm sure you wouldn't say cheap way of, of, I mean, cheap syntactic way of, of being like, this is const now. But before, mm -hmm. like, you can access it right of all, and you can just say, no one else is left. Mm -hmm. Part of this is you guys are trying to kind of rewrite the uh, On the read side, if I want to move or read iterator one, Node. Mm -hmm. The worst case, the big notation for that is big O of the number of threads that we access in your PKM. So the question was, if I'm reading the list, Sorry, if I'm reading the list and I'm advancing an iterator one position, then what is the efficiency of that operation to get to the next node? You have to go to the zombie list. It could be the full. You should have a length of the number of threads. That uh, that's actually not true. Um, it does not have to touch the zombie list at all. Because at all times, the actual, see the zombie list is only a list of nodes, of pointers into the list, nodes that could potentially be zombies, that could potentially be deleted at some later time. The list itself is a doubly linked list where all the pointers are atomic. So moving from one node to the next is O1 because it's just reading one atomic pointer and going to the next node. Now, which node is the next node may depend on what sort of concurrent writes are going on. But there is always exactly one next node for each node in the list. So what the zombie list does is entirely separate from when you're iterating through the list. The zombie list is a place to keep track of nodes which have been logically erased but not yet deleted from memory. Ah, ah, okay. I, I think I see where your question is coming from then. So the question was, when I move off a node, doesn't it then become eligible for deletion if it was deleted? And the answer is no, because we don't track node by node what nodes are eligible. We track simply when you acquire a read handle, then that marks your point in time at which you started accessing the list. 
from that point until you release that read handle, no zombie nodes can be destroyed. So it doesn't matter how many iterators you create, where they walk in the list, where you go, we're pinning all of the nodes that are destroyed during that read operation until you're done with them. And then when that read handle is destroyed, all of those nodes that were deleted during your entire read operation may become eligible for destruction. So that list has a length of a number of threads potentially. That the zombie list has a length that's that's potentially linear in the number of threads. It's possible the last one is the only one that's still an active reader. And it's possible you might walk the whole list and then decide to do no work. It's possible the last one is an active reader, so it's possible you might walk the whole list and do no work. You walk the list, or you just look at the end nodes where the last reader is time spent. Can't you ensure that no readers anywhere on the list? Well, Whichever way you search, I'll choose the opposite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so the answer is that the um, iterator operations are O1. The operation that is potentially expensive is dis is releasing a read handle, and that's when the zombie list is walked. Repeatedly doing fine to cause me a lot of issues. Repeatedly. Just taking a head repeatedly. So the question was, would taking a head, I mean, I assume you mean begin? Like begin, right, and then I so, release it, and then I take it again, and I release it. Um, like I'm checking to see if I can get rid of that element. Uh, not entirely. So the question was, does, is calling begin repeatedly or having a bunch of iterators that come and go a problematic? And the answer is no. There is not a one-to-one -one mapping between iterators and read handles. A read handle is the way you acquire an iterator, but you can acquire many iterators using the same read handle. Or it gets larger to one. It doesn't matter. I acquire right. a read handle and let it go. Meanwhile, everyone else has a read handle, which is which they're doing which they're going. There's one guy holding an active read handle. So this taking and repeating, I'm walking this list again and again and again. That is true. And it is it is true that if you have one very old reader and you have a lot of activity that has occurred since that reader was created, the list can potentially get long and there can be a fair amount of activity walking that list. There are ways to compress the list as read handles are expired, but there can be some issues with that with regard to correctness. Um, the Naive implementation of that yields a problem where when the container is destroyed, it is not safe to release a read handle to that container. And that becomes very problematic because enforcing that all read handles to the container are released before the container is destroyed is not always feasible. The comment was, you can work a, a shared pointer in here that will handle it for you. Um, and the answer is no, you need atomic shared pointer. Because the zombie list is maintained from multiple threads simultaneously. Well, if, if each of your zombie list nodes has a, a regular shared pointer to the original node, such that when the node is linked into the list, obviously you're not going to delete it. But then once it has been unlinked out of the list, then you start maintaining it with shared footers in zombie list nodes. And once its reference count drops to zero and it's been unlinked, then at that point it dies. So the comment, now that I understand, the comment was if the zombie list node contained a shared pointer to the list node, then when the zombie list node was destroyed, then the original list node was destroyed. That's not the challenging part. It's not that hard to walk through the zombie list and call delete on the node pointer. The problem is maintaining the zombie list in a thread safe fashion. Well, I think the, the attack vector over there was that uh, whenever I take the begin and then drop it again, I have to walk this entire zombie list just walking it, which is easy, but it's O of N, and I can do that repeatedly by just calling it again. 
so the comment is I can I can cause on behavior every time I call begin. And once again, the answer is no, because calling begin does not request a read handle. You requested a read handle before you called begin when you acquired a read lock on the container. So once you acquire a read lock on the container, that gives you a read handle that protects every iterator that you acquire under that read handle. Yes, you can call lock read and then unlock it in a row many, many times, but that is not code that people are likely to write, and it's also um, potentially may give you inconsistent results if you wanted some sort of consistency with what you're seeing in the list. Question. You said uh, single write or multiple readers. Is that applicable to the whole list or to a particular node that write or operating on? So is ah. it possible parallel modification in, of different parts of, of the list? Ah, so the question was, I said single write or multiple readers. Can a writer be operating on two different parts? Can two different writers be operating on different parts of the list simultaneously? And the answer is no. In the RCU algorithm, it is really single writer. The there is a single writer for the whole list, and that's enforced with a mutex. Um, the reason why that property is actually helpful, as I mentioned a little bit, but I'll stress it again, is it is very easy to reason about the behavior of an eventually consistent list where there's a single writer, but it's very challenging to reason about the behavior of an eventually consistent list where there's multiple writers. And that requires a little bit of a higher level understanding of what's going on under the hood. It certainly would be possible to implement a lockless um, multiple writer, multiple reader list using this mechanism and using the same lock, read, lock, write, read handle, write handle mechanism. But it's not clear what the safe API for the writer would be. Because it's so pos it's, there's so many possibilities for um, surprising behavior. For example, if two uh, two threads insert a node with the same value simultaneously, you know you really don't want that to happen. This is why it seems to me that it would be more useful to have lockless associative containers. Because with a lockless associative container, then your write either succeeds or updates the existing value, but you don't have a behavior where you added the same node twice. It, it can be um, extremely tricky, because, particularly because in the case of multiple writers accessing the same list, you can have a case where one writer has an iterator to node 7. And I update node 7 concurrently with another writer deleting node 7. So now I've updated a zombie, which is legal, but it's surprising because my update just disappeared. So there are a lot of consequences to allowing multiple writers simultaneously, and it seems like you would need a higher level API to manage the complexity of that and have a little more knowledge about the data contained in the list and its meaning so that you could have a meaningful structure. Other questions? What's the advantage of this approach compared to using persistent data structures? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand the context of that question. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm not quite clear what you mean by the the concept of persistent data structures. Ah, immutable data structures. Immutable data structures where you have shared common state and then you would 
create a copy, modify the entire, create a copy of the entire data structure, <coughs> modify that copy, and then update the pointer atomically. Um, well, if you like, you can implement that with the copy on write guarded, and that will be exactly that behavior because you will get the behavior where a reader will see a consistent view and then a writer will have the opportunity to make any changes it likes and then atomically replace the value stored in that with the new container. And that can make sense for some scenarios, but the overhead of repeatedly copying the data is significant. Oh, I understand the term persistent data structure. It's like a console or list where yeah. you're sharing the tails of all your linked lists together, which is superficially reminiscent of, of what RCA is doing with manipulating linked lists. But that's about where the similarity ends. Because persistent data structures are about having sort of many different readers who may or may not be in different threads, and they're all they've all got immutable data. But the guarded as a whole is about having definitely many different threads and mutable data, and they need to see each other's mutations. Right? They need to, they need to publish the mutations back and forth. You do have ah, okay. Excellent. So the comment was that persistent data, as understood by Arthur, um, which I will take as, as read, um, is persistent data structures are about having immutable data where modifications are not propagated necessarily between threads that are reading simultaneously. Whereas libguarded is entirely about managing the complexity of publishing changes to shared state to other threads, which are reading it concurrently. Does, does that... Certainly, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your context, and, uh, but yes, let's... Still, which is kind of my talk on Friday where I talk about a, uh, a <laughs> ah. <laughs> then, then definitely, I'm curious about hearing about persistent data structures on Friday. All right. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all very much for your time. <laughs>